I would like first of all to thank organizers and particularly um, Francesca um, to, for inviting me here. It's a privilege uh, to be among uh, the wonderful speakers um, of, of this uh, symposium. And uh, um, I would like to uh, challenge a little bit of your imagination uh, with my talk. And I will be talking about novel cellular determinants of Parkinson disease. And uh, um, most probably all of you know what Parkinson disease is. But what I would like to, uh, to emphasize is that there are more than 20 already genes identified with the Parkinson disease associated mutations, and including, uh, of course, alpha synuclein. And uh, although they created uh, really and built our understanding of the main processes involved in this uh, disease, uh, the actually genetic forms of Parkinson uh, comprise only less than 80% of all Parkinson cases. And uh, one of those genes which was identified and which is one of the newer ones, PARC14, uh, is still a mystery to some degree and uh, not in the mainstream, but that will be the focus of my talk. And uh, why? I would like to talk about this gene and about this protein because what we found that uh, in idiopathic or sporadic uh, PD cases, which are over 80% of all Parkinson patients have, there is a very substantial uh, deficiency in this particular phospholipase A2 group 6 uh, protein. And, um, and we uh, for, we are focusing on this protein and its function, and uh, um, today I will show you the mechanism which this protein is involved in and um, uh, how it has changed in humans and how it has changed in animal models and what we can do about this and whether or not uh, it's up to you to decide whether or not uh, this protein can be a next uh, major target for drug or for treatment development for Parkinson's disease. So, um, I will start with calcium signaling and uh, what a specific mechanism which uh, is uh, established at one of the major background, you know, mechanism which is essential for normal health life function of virtually all of the cells. And uh, if you don't know this mechanism, it works very simple. So calcium uh, in ER need to be uh, relatively rather high uh, to either be released in enough quantities to trigger different cellular, pro cellular mechanisms, cellular pathways, or even to fold uh, the proteins um, uh, in the in the ER properly, and it is very tightly controlled by the mechanism called the stoperated calcium entry. When calcium drops for whatever reasons uh, in the ER, then it is well established already that uh, ER, ER membrane um, uh, re resident protein stem one uh, aggregates and it sends the signal to plasma membrane ion channels, or A1 in particular, uh, making them open up, get calcium into the cell, and then it's taken back through circa uh, and re refilling the stores. And uh, the main uh, school of thought is uh, that SIM1 directly interacts with this ORA1 channel, and that's the mechanism of uh, ORA1 activation, which was uh, proved and uh, beautiful studies uh, expressing different forms and different uh, variants of STEM1 and ORA1 protein. And they do, in fact, uh, when overexpressed, they interact. And this is driving this process of calcium entry. However, um, a little bit, some time ago, already we published a paper um, showing that there is uh, another protein, which is the plasma membrane resident protein, which is this phospholipase group 6, very specific variant, splice variant of this protein, which uh, sits at plasma membrane and somehow is involved in signal transduction from ER to this ion channels. 
And uh, I'm not showing this data at the moment, but what we found was uh, that this protein and terminus of this protein actually interacts with C-terminus of, uh, uh, of um, uh, STEM1. And uh, this interaction is essential for signal transduction to array channels in endogenous conditions. So in endogenous conditions, virtually uh, all the cells which we tested so far require uh, the presence and full functionality of this uh, phospholipase. And this is the one which, uh, when we looked at uh, the cells from idiopathic PD patients, uh, we found that there is a very significant loss of expression of this particular variant of phospholipase. You can see this is log scale, and uh, this is about six-fold decrease in expression. While uh, for comparison, other variant which most people uh, in the field of this phospholipases are looking at have no difference whatsoever. And this is shorter splice variant, uh, which is uh, encoded by the same gene, but uh, it doesn't have very, very important part of the protein, which we believe makes all the difference for Parkinson and for this calcium signaling. Um, peculiarly enough or was that none of other um, parts of this stoperated calcium entry, this channel, STEM1 or TRIPC1, um, they don't have any difference between control and idiopathic PD patients. So we also recently found, we looked at the brains of the Parkinson, of the idiopathic PD Parkinson patients, and uh, we found that this is control patients, example of the uh, defaminergic neurons, TH positive neurons in uh, control patients, and this is one of the idiopathic PD patients. You can see that there is very little neurons, defaminergic TH positive neurons left, and if you will amplify, uh, if you look uh, more closely at the, those neurons, phospholipase is highly expressed uh, in those neurons, uh, in TH positive neurons, and as you can see here, both uh, the level of phospholipase expression and TH in uh, uh, idiopathic PD patients is very much lower than, uh, significantly lower than in control ones. What we found was, uh, is that uh, there is a clear uh, correlation between uh, intensity of phospholipase staining and TH intensity of the TH staining. And uh, there is uh, the majority of neurons in control patients have both uh, high expression of phospholipase and high TH staining, while those idiopathic PD patients have their subset uh, remaining neurons which haven't done, died yet. Uh, they have a uh, very low expression level of phospholipase and TH. And uh, this is shown here. 43% in control patients is high, T, uh, high phospholipase neurons and uh, more than 30% in IDPD remaining neurons um, uh, have very low levels of PLA2 expression. So from this analysis, you cannot say who drives what. So it may be TH uh, is disappearing and that's why PLA2 is going down, or it may be PLA2 is going down and dragging kind of uh, making those neurons die and lose TH. So how to test this? And um, we found that, again, returning back to calcium, is that when we looked at the, uh, this is the experiments done in primary skin fibroblasts from those idiopathic PD patients. And you can see that this stoperated tepsigargan induced calcium entry is very significantly suppressed in idiopathic PD patients in comparison with control ones. The mutant PD associated mutant of phospholipase also have very similar suppression of phospholipase, of uh, calcium. And you can see that, uh, that in all patients which we looked so far, uh, the controls are, uh, have high calcium entry, the stoperated calcium entry, while IDPD patients and this mutant patient have uh, uh, very closely um, but very low levels of this calcium entry. So who cares? And uh, what we tried to, when we reproduce the same phenomenon of the impairment of this phospholipase, very precise, um, can we shut down the light, please? 
Um, so if we, when we looked at uh, the, uh, we created the situation when we deleted uh, the end terminus of this phospholipase genetically in the mouse model. And, um, and uh, uh, we uh, created an animal which we called exon 2 knockout. We deleted this exon 2 ca which carries uh, the first uh, natural uh, ATG site uh, in uh, starting the transcription of this protein. And we hoped that uh, the transcription would start at this uh, cryptic second ATG in exon 4. And it actually did. So we have fully functional, uh, 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 catalytically functional, because this is catalytic domain. Those are anchoring repeats uh, in this protein. And uh, this protein in this mice is fully catalytically active, but it lacks this end terminus, which we believe and we have evidence uh, interacts with STEM1. And as I will show you in a moment, uh, in fact, this is the, uh, this modification resulted in uh, disappearance of Ex uh, of uh, stoperated calcium entry in this animal. So this is a mouse embryonic fibroblast, and this is again calcium entry in wild type um, animals, and this is in this exon 2 knockout. What we also found was that the stores, uh, the ER stores in this exon 2 knockout cells are very, very significantly depleted. Uh, which uh, is kind of expected thing that if you don't have this refilling mechanism and it's faltering, then you may have this uh, deficiency in, uh, in the refilling of the stores and the emptiness of the stores, which uh, we can uh, see the same exact same uh, phenomenon, this pattern in, uh, uh, in IPS derived um, A9 midbrain of hemorrhagic neurons, which are shown here. And you can see that when we created those cells, uh, those neurons, and studied them from, uh, from uh, uh, maps uh, of wild type and exon 2 knockout animals, uh, we see the same pattern of the loss of uh, stoperated calcium entry and uh, the loss of calcium from ER. Uh, and so who cares about calcium? Well, it, apparently this mice uh, <laughs> did care. And uh, it took us a little bit of time to actually uh, wait and wait and wait and wait. And around 12 months, it starts to show the signs of uh, very classical signs of Parkinson's disease. And this is the severity of uh, motor dysfunction. Uh, which uh, is age-dependent, progressive, and as an example, it's, uh, I showed here human age equivalent years. It falls within the right uh, window of uh, idiopathic PD patients, which was kind of extra uh, sweet uh, candy for us to uh, keep going uh, with these animals. So what we found was that at this uh, time, around 16 months, when the process already is uh, up and running, uh, this, um, uh, the pathology. Uh, this uh, neurodegeneration happens predominantly in substantia nigra compacta. And if you look at substantia nigra compacta, you can see very dramatic difference appearing there, which is age, again, uh, progressive for the uh, loss of the feminergic neurons. You can see this uh, from 8 to 24 months. More than 50% of neurons are lost uh, at 24 months. And uh, we more precisely, we can follow in this, uh, in this model uh, nice uh, development of the, this process of this pathology using balance beam tests, using pole tests, rotor rot tests. This mice doesn't have weakness of the, uh, of the limbs, as you can see with grip tests. And uh, it has a very beautiful uh, L-DOPA uh, uh, responses, uh, which are the same uh, type of responses as humans have, uh, which is age and dose-dependent uh, recovery of those motor function. So well, what else we found in this mice? Uh, we found that there is a very substantial uh, aggregation of uh, accumulation of LC3 in uh, the feminergic neurons of this mice. 
And when we looked at, uh, at um, autophagy in those mouse embryonic fibroblasts uh, using tandem uh, M-cherry EGFP construct of LC3, which we express in those cells, you can see that everything uh, goes and reaches uh, uh, lysosomes and uh, EGFP is uh, nicely quenched there. Uh, while in this, uh, in the cells from exon 2 knockout animals, there are virtually very high correlation coefficient, as you can see here, uh, and on this correlation map uh, between red and green, um, saying that, well, we're getting stuck somewhere, all those uh, autophagosomes. And uh, we did all the, like, to convince ourselves that we actually, that this phospholipase, which drives all those processes, we did uh, the, uh, the uh, dominant effects of those uh, uh, deletions of this N uh, terminus or PD associated mutations. Uh, when you express them in control in wild-type cells, as you can see here, you have very substantial loss of stoperated calcium entry, you have loss of uh, calcium from the stores, and you have very substantial, again, um, uh, autophagic dysfunction. We can also return, like, do the opposite, uh, and we can rescue if we'll take now uh, this exon 2 knockout cells we, by expressing wild-type protein, but not this um, uh, PLA2 group, uh, not PD-associated mutant, we can actually restore normal uh, calcium function, uh, ER, and we can also restore uh, normal um, autophagic function. So uh, PLA2 seems to really uh, guide all those processes. And what about humans? So returning back to the cells from the patients, again, we found that in control patients, it's, uh, they have uh, totally normal autophagy, while idiopathic PD patients uh, have very high uh, this correlation coefficient uh, using the same um, tandem construct of um, LC3. Uh, similar to the mice, uh, it has very high um, uh, correlation coefficient, uh, meaning that uh, the autophagy is impaired, and so is uh, this PD-associated mutant. So, can we fix it? So again, it may be still, we thought, uh, it can be still some kind of uh, uh, collateral changes. So, uh, it turns out that yes, we can uh, restore the function, and this is stoperated calcium entry, by expressing full length uh, this uh, variant of this phospholipase, uh, we can uh, uh, significantly uh, elevate or restore the uh, stoperated calcium entry, and uh, we can also improve very significantly uh, autophagy in this idiopathic PD patient, in the cells from idiopathic PD patients. So we came up with this, we proposed the pathway uh, we propose that impairment of this PARC14, PLA2 group 6, uh, dependent calcium signaling may be a novel, previously unknown, uh, and unaccounted for determinant of Parkinson disease. And uh, we believe that we showed in this paper that idiopathic and genetic dysfunction of stoperated activation of this PLA2 group 6 protein, plasma membrane associated one, leads to uh, impairment of stoperated calcium entry, depletion of calcium stores, autophagic dysfunction, the feminergic neuronal death, and uh, motor dysfunction uh, typical for uh, Parkinson uh, uh, idiopathic PD patients. And uh, the major advantage of this model and uh, about uh, this whole process was that it was progressive, it was age dependent, and uh, all the changes uh, with Parkinson's disease um, uh, were there related to motor function. So how about the, uh, the cl more classical uh, way of thinking and line of thoughts um, and uh, showing that synuclein aggregation, autophagic dysfunction, ER stress, or mitochondrial dysfunction, each of them uh, separately or in whatever uh, mix and match combination 
uh, can lead to Parkinson's disease. So how does our kind of new mechanism fit into this classical way of thought? Um, and here, what that's where proposing um, the unifying model for the processes which may be happening in idiopathic PD patients. So we already know that uh, that idiopathic, we see this idiopathic dysfunction of uh, uh, this phospholipase A2, and we, it's uh, kind of uh, um, expected, and uh, no one will be surprised if this impairment of stoperated calcium entry can actually uh, make the cells either cause uh, or make the cells more vulnerable to mitochondrial dysfunction. So uh, ER calcium depletion, of course, will make them more vulnerable or even can trigger ER stress and proteostasis dysfunction. As I already showed, we have strict evidence, experimental evidence, that depletion of the stores uh, actually does cause autophagic dysfunction. And the last but not the least, uh, we believe that this is, again, no surprise that uh, autophagic dysfunction can cause aggregation of uh, sinuclein, uh, and all together that can comprise this uh, age-dependent, slowly development, developing uh, phenomenon known as Parkinson disease. So considering again the fact that uh, virtually all patients which we looked so far, and we looked at uh, primary skin fibroblasts from those patients, and we looked already, I showed you, uh, the feminergic neurons in substantia nigra, postmortem brains of those patients, and we are also at that time looking for the blood uh, of idiopathic PD patients, and it looks again very preliminary, but um, it looks like this pathway can be seen impaired also there. Uh, so, if this is the major repetitive uh, kind of motif of uh, um, and previously unknown uh, hallmark of uh, idiopathic PD, then uh, this, uh, this theme may be not that uh, far-fetched reality. And uh, this PARC-14, this PLA-2, may be actually upstream uh, impairment of this uh, uh, of this uh, target may be upstream from uh, um, from everything that we know so far on all other levels, of cellular level. So this is again. I'm uh, I uh, realize that uh, this is kind of the part of uh, um, question, you know, imagination. So is that real or not? So everyone, when I show it on my phone, everyone tried to kind of turn it around and say, well, this is upside down. Well, if you do a couple of experiments, maybe not. Maybe that's the reality which you see. So um, how we will test this? Because all those, uh, you know, all those uh, uh, interactions are, need very deep uh, um, uh, studies, and we don't have resources, uh, my lab is small, um, so we want everyone to kind of uh, get excited and uh, may try different parts of this uni unifying scheme. So what we did already, we tried this uh, PLA2 group 6 calcium synuclein uh, potential link. So. The idea was that if this pathway is impaired in those uh, idiopathic PD patients, uh, they have this PLA2 group 6 deficiency. But guess what they have also? They have wild type unmutated synuclein. All of us have. So why some people have uh, develop, uh, developing uh, idiopathic PD and others not? Well, maybe because uh, idiopathic conditions uh, have this deficiency. And so we created uh, the animal which has both, uh, expresses human wild type synuclein and has inducible deficiency in this PLA2 group 6 and calcium for that reason. And uh, the, the idea was and the hypothesis was that working together uh, this uh, 
calcium deficiency, PLA2 calcium deficiency can actually enhance or accelerate synucleopathy, the feminergic neuronal death, and motor dysfunction and not motor dysfunction. Uh, causing this idiopathic Parkinson disease. And I don't have time to show you the first data from these animals, but they do have all of the above, and they, uh, it develops upon induction of this deficiency, and uh, this uh, seems to be the first model which has not only synucleopathy, but also very substantial, very significant uh, neuronal, progressive neuronal death and motor dysfunction and this non-motor um, um, uh, dysfunction as well. So, um, what other way, how else we can test if this vision is uh, real or the matter of our imagination only? So, remember I told you that, uh, that, st uh, that uh, restoration of the function of this phospholipase, this particular variant in, in the cells from idiopathic PD patients, in fact, uh, significantly increase, restores stoperated calcium entry and significantly improves autophagy. So, can we restore uh, the expression, you know, uh, get this full func fully functional phospholipase uh, into the feminergic neurons? So, any, uh, anyone wants to try this in their brain? I don't think so. So we did it in the mice uh, to start with. So what we did, we took the mice, which were now developing this, so the, the, is deficient with the stoperated calcium entry, and using uh, AV25 um, uh, SYN1 uh, driven expression of MIG tagged full length, this variant uh, of PLA2, as you can see, uh, it does go very specifically to the feminergic neurons. Uh, we looked if we can fix the problem which these mice have. And this is the problem on balanced beam test, as I already showed you. This mice develops uh, age-dependent uh, progressive uh, uh, worsening of motor function measured by missteps, number of missteps on this test. And uh, as you can see here, this is exon 2 control, non-injected uh, animals. This is the animals injected with saline, simply. And this is the animals in which we uh, stereotactically injected at uh, the, this phospholipase um, into substantia nigra, as I can sh I'm showing you here. And uh, uh, in comparison, this with wild type control animals then injected and the animals injected again with the same uh, phospholipase. And you can see that we can actually delay uh, the uh, uh, impairment of motor function by about three months in this animal. So we don't know <clears throat> why it started to go up, maybe because the expression, you know, is uh, going down. We don't have uh, enough evidence uh, to uh, exclude this possibility. But at least about three months uh, shift in, the, uh, in this curve uh, makes it uh, about 10 years in human scale. So also what we found was that uh, if these injected animals have a very uh, very good response to L-DAPA. What I mean by this is that at this point, at the point of 18 to 20 months, uh, this is uh, L-DAPA injection in uh, control saline injected animals, meaning Parkinson uh, animals, and this is in those treated animals, which means that uh, with these treated animals, even at the late stages of uh, uh, the of the development of this uh, disease. Uh, we can use very low, the lowest dose of L-DOPA, which can uh, avoid all the problems. And uh, this is simply to, uh, to summarize what I just showed you, that today's reality is that when clinical diagnosis happens, there is already too late to do anything and there is nothing to do. So what we want is uh, to treat the animals or eventually humans at this point and delay the development of this motor dysfunction. And as I, can, I showed you here, we um, happily already and luckily achieving this uh, goal. And uh, three months delay in mouse are equivalent to 10 years in humans. Do we know everything? 
uh, not yet, but uh, we think that uh, the emerging uh, picture is uh, pretty damn attractive. <laughs> so, um, so this is uh, one of the students, the most, uh, the best student I ever had, uh, Ellen Yem, who did a lot of the studies. And uh, I would like to acknowledge his work and uh, thank our collaborators, which put me on this Parkinson disease path and helped me uh, uh, develop all the techniques, Parkinson-related techniques. And uh, we have wonderful collaborators, uh, uh, Eliza, Maria Fr Fr Francoise, and uh, Carali, and uh, Tom Beach uh, provided us with those uh, brain se sections. And we are working on uh, cryo-EM structure of this phospholipase at the moment. So I will leave you with this unifying model, and thank you very much, and I will take the questions. Um, two questions only, so Ori and someone else. So it's a very nice talk. Um, I have a question. So calcium homeostasis is super important for uh, dopaminergic neurotransmission uh, before neurodegeneration. So I was wondering if in these mice, which presumably have this knockout from the germline, um, if there's any change in kind of reward mediated behavior or something like this earlier in life. So we don't see any uh, kind of uh, other changes. So the, this my animals are pretty uh, healthy until 12 months old. And uh, we, uh, we, have, uh, we have both now conditional and uh, uh, constitutive uh, germlines of the animals uh, which we can share. Uh, and um, so anyone who may be interested in looking at the processes on this unifying scheme <laughs> or outside the scheme uh, will be very happy to collaborate. So it's very interesting that in Alzheimer's disease, also a um, knockdown of a PLA2 group 4, I believe, um, Leonard Mookie's studies has also shown rescue of an Alzheimer's disease mouse model uh, phenotype. And they found changes in eicosanoid production, fatty acid production. Did you look at the uh, lipids in your mouse model and, and see changes there? Uh, so we didn't, and for one very specific reason. So uh, PLA2 group 4 is actually calcium uh, calcium uh, dependent phospholipase. There is uh, many different variants of phospholipase A2 and they are all uh, structurally and functionally totally different. So this uh, uh, PLA2 group 4 is, uh, needs calcium rise to get activated. So phospholipase uh, group uh, 6 uh, uh, is uh, calcium independent. It doesn't matter for it uh, calcium goes down or up uh, it activates by depletion of the stores. So it's a very specific target, and uh, that's the only phospholipase which is actually linked to Parkinson's disease. So we, don't, uh, we didn't have uh, time or uh, uh, facility to, to do anything else. Okay, I'm afraid we're running over, so yeah. we're going to have to move on to the next speaker. Hello everyone, my name is Lily. I'm a PhD student from Francesca Bartolini lab, and today I'm very honored to be here to present my project, Microtubule Dynamics at Presynaptic Contacts are modulated by neuronal activity and affected by synaptic injury. Uh, I'll start a brief uh, introduction about microtubules in neurons. Microtubules are hollow tubular structures that are dynamically assembled from alpha and beta tubulin heterodimers uh, and undergo sto stochastic changes of polymerization and depolymerization. In differentiated neurons, the majority of microtubules are acentrosomal and with free minus ends exposed. In dendrites, they f uh, form mixed polarity with uh, parallel and par anti-parallel arrays, while in axons, they're all minus, uh, plus and out. So uh, a fraction of these microtubules can be highly dynamic, as shown here labeled by EB3 at microtubule growing plus ends in hippocampal neurons. And they constantly undergo dynamic instability, which is characterized by four parameters, microtubule growth, microtubule shrinkage, 
uh, catastrophe, which is the transition from growth to shrinkage, and rescue, which is from uh, shrinkage to growth. So however, and even dynamic microtubules can be stabilized downstream of homeostatic or regulated pathways by either microtubule end capping or site binding of motors and maps. Once stabilized, microtubules leave long enough to become substrates of a variety of enzymes and accumulate tubulin post translation modifications, preferentially on, uh, on the C-terminal tails of alpha or beta tubulin, which are exposed on the lattice of a microtubule surface. So uh, the combinatorial nature of these uh, modifications give rise to a tubulin code uh, which regulates a variety of neuronal functions, such as the regulation of microtubule-dependent motors, microtubule severing enzymes, MAPs such as tau, kinases and phosphatases, metabolic enzymes, and organelle or vesicle loading and transport. So in our recent study, we have underscored an important role of neuronal dynamic microtubules in a beta-induced synaptotoxicity through tau. Briefly, we find that oligomeric A-beta, which in its insoluble form accumulate in Alzheimer's disease brain, can induce subsets of toxic hyperstable microtubules. And this, uh, and this hyperstable microtubules through uh, row signaling and MDL1 activation in neurons. The stabilization of dynamic microtubules in axonal or dendritic uh, shafts leads to a cellular stress response that, uh, cause, that causes tau dissociation and hyperphosphorylation as an attempt to try to restore normal level of dynamic and unmodified microtubules. And interestingly, uh, even the stabilization of dynamic microtubules alone is sufficient to induce synaptotoxicity, including spine loss, axonal transport defects, and synaptic transmission deficits. However, we still don't know whether microtubule dynamics are directly affected by synapses and whether these are directly related to A-beta synaptotoxicity. So to test whether A-beta affects dynamic microtubules as uh, synapses, we set up two robust microscopy assays directly measuring growing microtubule plus end uh, uh, dynamics at pre and post synaptic sites. We know that from Dr. Gray's observation that microtubules at pre, uh, postsynaptic sites uh, can contact the postsynaptic dense material by electron microscopy. And, uh, and then uh, later on, uh, many studies have shown that microtubule invasion into spines, shown in this movie I took in he mature hippocampal neurons, transfected with EB3 labeled dynamic microtubules and DS red as a filler that they can uh, invade into spines and uh, regulate it by NMD receptor and calcium signaling. And this invasion into spines itself can in turn regulate spine morphology and synaptic activity. As far as the presynaptic sites, more than 30 years, years ago, Dr. Gray advanced uh, different f microtubule fixation technique and first observed pools of the microtubules at presynaptic sites in rat uh, cortex and hippocampus uh, under electron microscopy. Those include the pools of microtubules that are uh, synaptic vesicle cloths and closely attached to active zone and also the synaptosomal coiled microtubules close to presynaptic mitochondria. It is therefore possible that those microtubules may directly interact with components of the active zone, allowing the correct delivery of, uh, or transport of vesicles. After Gray's observations, uh, very few studies have actually followed up. A few examples include the map labeled stable microtubule bundled loops and uh, EB3 labeled dynamic pioneer microtubules in neuromuscular junctions in Drosophila neurons. And also, uh, interestingly, and also uh, similar to what Dr. Gray has observed in uh, mammalian neurons, a marginal band of stable microtubules tr uh, can mediate the transport and organization of mitochondria in giant uh, synaptic terminals of goldfish. And the only example in mammalian neurons that have been followed up is shown in the giant uh, callosal terminals of mice neurons, where they show that microtubules can regulate synaptic vesicle transport between the interspallings. 
However, it is still unknown uh, whether there are pools of dynamic or stable microtubules uh, localized to presynaptic boutons in mammalian hippocampal neurons, and whether these, mi um, uh, these microtubules are regulated or regulate directly the tr synaptic transmission during synaptic activation, injury, or toxicity. So in order to answer these questions, uh, because of uh, the size of hippocampal bouton and the limitation of our conventional optical resolution, I took a closer look only at the dynamic pool of EB3 labeled axonal microtubules that make contacts with V-glute labeled excitatory boutons. I developed a novel assay to uh, distinguish presynaptic microtubules based on their uh, plus and contact with V-glute defined here as the interbutal microtubules which have no contact with V-glut or interbutal microtubules that uh, contact with V-glut. So I generated movies and uh, chymographs as shown here with the y-axis as the time and x-axis uh, as the distance from cell body to the distal uh, axon. And the interbutal microtubules can be further subclassified based on their plus con and contact with V-glut on the chymograph versus the ones that nucleate or rescued at V-glut, or on the chymograph, the tracks that start at V-glut. But we cannot distinguish those two populations because EB3 only labels microtubule growing plus ends. And second are the microtubules that catastrophe at V-glut, and third are the ones that pass through V-glut. And from chymograph analysis of EB3 comet relative to stable uh, presynaptic punta in the untreated neurons, I find there are a higher density of the longer-lived um, intrabutal microtubules uh, at steady state. Then I further analyzed the pool of the intrabutal microtubules uh, to understand whether they have preferential regulation at the butons. And I, uh, I find that interestingly, only the uh, experimentally measured probability of EB3 starting at V-glut but not ending at V-glut is significantly higher than the predictive random uh, probability, which uh, refer to the, uh, the probability that they interact directly with V-glut. This suggests that there's a preferential regulation of EB3 comets starting at the boutons. So I, next, I examined whether this preferential regulation of EB3 comets starting at the bouton is affected by synaptic activation. And uh, I developed a protocol to induce synaptic activation in mature hippocampal neurons by pre-treating the neurons with uh, MDA receptor antagonist AP5 to first bring down the uh, overall firing of synaptic activity in hippocampal neur uh, neurons and followed by a washout and incubation with spicuclein, which is a GABA-A receptor antagonist, to synchronously and also acutely induce synaptic activation. And interestingly, I observed that only uh, one minute after bicuclein incubation, there's a significant increase in the comets that's starting at V-glut, but not the washout control, as shown here in the movie and the chymograph. So this uh, demonstrating that the nucleation or rescue of dynamic microtubules occur at presynaptic sites and is induced uh, by synaptic transmission. So then to uh, examine whether this is uh, uh, further true upon physiological synaptic activation, I added BDNF directly to untreated hippocampal neurons, and this also resulted in a significant increase in the comets that starting at V-glut. Uh, with the very similar uh, kinetic to the one, uh, ones that stimulated after pharmacological synaptic activation. So altogether, these uh, results are very exciting uh, uh, because they are the first to show that the induction of neurotransmitter release and synaptic activation is coupled to local induced dynamic microtubules. And they also suggest that the synaptic transmission may require de novo nucleation or rescue of dynamic microtubules at the sites of uh, intense memory remodeling and transport. So now the first uh, key question we want to address here is to ask whether the increase in distally oriented EB3 comets at the boutons are a result of de novo nucleation or uh, by nucleation complex or uh, rescue events that uh, from previous existing microtubules by rescuing factors. And we know that 
the, uh, in, uh, during acentrosomal microtubule nucleation in developing neurons, gamma tubulin and augmin complex are required, and gamma tubulin mediates the, uh, provi or providing the nucleating material, while the augmin complex restricting the polarity of uh, the newly nucleated microtubules. But uh, we still don't know what, uh, what is regulated in mature uh, neurons. So to address this question, I first tested the hypothesis that microtubules starting at boutons uh, are derived from microtubule nucleation, which would uh, very likely to require both gamma tubulin and augmin complex. So I first examined the uh, gamma tubulin localization relative to boutons in mature hippocampal neurons transfected with either gamma tubulin emerald or uh, emerald control as the cytosolic accumulation at the bouton. And I find that there's there, uh, there, uh, there is 80% uh, of co-localization of gamma tubulin with the stable v glut pancta, uh, which is the significant percentage uh, higher than the uh, emerald vector control. Next, I knocked down gamma tubulin for six days in mature hippocampal neurons by two independent oligos and find a sig significant, significant decrease in the comet density in both axons and dendrites. And interestingly, the decrease in comet density uh, in axons are mostly contributed from the comets that directly starting at V-glut, suggesting there's uh, uh, a nucleation at the bouton is involved. And when we, uh, when we knock down gamma tubulin for four days, which at a level that did not affect comet density by itself, I find a significant uh, inhibition of the increase in the comets that's starting at V-glut upon bicuculin induced acute synaptic activation. So altogether, these data strongly suggest that the dynamic microtubule initiating at boutons are a result of the novel microtubule nucleation, and that presynaptic boutons are hotspots for gamma tubulin dependent uh, microtubule nucleation in axons. So a very interesting observation that we find is uh, that all the nu uh, newly nucleated microtubules at boutons are actually mono-oriented towards the distal axon. We know that the augmin complex regulates microtubule uh, nucleation polarity in non-neural cells and in developing neurons. If augmin is involved, it would not only provide an explanation for this uh, new, uh, direction or uniform polarity of the nucleated microtubules at presynapses, but also provide an extra confirmation that those subsets of microtubules are actually uh, from de novo nucleation. So I, when I knocked down uh, augmin complex with the, uh, directly with the SHRNA against subunits one or seven of uh, the complex, I did not observe any changes in the comet density, but there's a significant increase in the percentage of comets moving retrogradely, uh, and most of which are directly starting at the boutons, as shown here in the movie, you, or the chymograph that you can see start at the V-glute labeled pancta. And this data strongly indicate that the synaptic transmission induced the novel nucleation of plus and directed uh, dynamic microtubules at boutons through gamma tubulin and augmin complex. So next, we inquire about the functional role of those uh, de novo nucleated microtubules at boutons and asked whether they could directly uh, mediate the enterograde motility of cargos away from boutons uh, through the interaction with dynamic microtubule ends possibly, or rather provide an anchor for dynamediated, uh, dynamediated uh, cargos back to the boutons. In order to test this, I set up experiments to examine synaptic vesicles or axonal organelle uh, dynamics and, whether, uh, and to test whether these changes in dynamics are dependent on microtubule de novo nucleation. So I selected markers of axonal organelles and recorded movies in a, a narrow time window where I saw an uh, uh, increase in microtubule nucleation upon synaptic activation. However, I did not observe any changes in RAP5, uh, RAP7, LAMP1, or mitochondria movement, indicating that those, uh, at, at, under those conditions, the, uh, these or organelle dynamics are not acutely affected by synaptic activation. Interestingly, however, when I analyzed the synaptic vesicle movement upon acute synaptic activation, uh, we've observed a significant increase 
in the percentage of moving v glute and synaptophysin labeled synaptic vesicles uh, that starting or ending at the boutons, well, there's no changes in the uh, preference of direction of the movement. So to further understand whether the local synaptic vesicle transport is dependent on de novo microtubule nucleation, I examined the motility of the mobile pool of v glute uh, in gamma tubuline knockdown neurons. And remarkably, I find the gamma tubuline knockdown strongly abrogated the increase in uh, the percentage of moving v glute and also the percentage uh, st uh, starting or ending at the boutons. And this suggests that the normal nu microtubule nucleation at boutons is indeed required for uh, synaptic vesicle interbouton transport. So lastly, I would like to thank uh, Francesca and members of, of our lab, and also our collaboration with uh, David Salter, Volker Hauke, Frank Polo, and uh, Michael Shilansky lab, and also my thesis committee. I'd like to take any questions. Thank you. Lily, that was an absolutely beautiful talk. Um, so your model uh, really predicts in an elegant way that uh, Taxol could induce peripheral neuropathy, and I wonder if you're looking at that because you'll damp down the microtubule dynamics, and that should affect your synaptic effects. Uh, yes, that's a very good point. Um, actually, so we only tested uh, Taxol on axonal dynamic microtubules, and we find that uh, by inhibiting dynamic microtubules in axons, it's sufficient to induce synaptotoxicity. And then, then the next uh, step that we're really uh, trying to do is to look at how that affects synapto, uh, synaptic or presynaptic microtubules. And we're generating these tools even better than Taxol is the photo switchable Taxol that can turn on and off directly at the local sites of presynapses. So I'm really excited to do this experiment. Really nice, beautiful data. Um, with the gamma tubulin at the presynapse, you showed that if you express it, it's there. Um, have you looked at it just with antibody staining to see if it's enriched? Uh, yes, actually I uh, did a couple of stainings, but they're, um, the, so they are, they are very, um, they're not as punctured eight as overexpression, mostly because um, either the antibody is not as good as, uh, like for staining, or um, the, the gamma tubulin is more like uh, prevalent everywhere in the neurons, but only like uh, activate with the nucleation complex. So, but you do see it. So, um, I, saw, I saw it in axons, but like I can't, tell for sure for now, I'm still working on and that. And the second question, quick question was that you, you know, you're looking at super pool uh, transport, right? What people have described this before, which is uh, interbutonic. But so you're correlating that with the elongation of microtubules, but that's it really doesn't, I mean, uh, to me, that doesn't make sense because the super pool trafficking occurs in both directions, right? So it would go, it's an interbuton trafficking, it would go backward and forward. And of course, you're looking at elongation of microtubules. So are you proposing that the elongating microtubules are the only ones in which the vesicle trafficking happens? Um, so I do, I, uh, I do observe uh, the uh, superpool synaptic vesicles uh, moving both directions. And we're trying to figure out uh, like what's the mechanism of directing this transport. For now, because we think either the elongation uh, of microtubules and that creates more dynamic plus ends that interact with the vesicles to allow it to move uh, anterogradely away from the bouton, or you could actually probably hop onto the uh, dynamic ends of newly generated microtubules for that to uh, move back to the boutons as a retrograde direction. But exactly how that happens, we, we still don't know. Yeah. yeah. Hi, very good talk, very nice. Thanks. So I had uh, actually the same questions as Roy. Uh, and, and I think it's, there was some paper about myosin, that there was myosin involvement in intrasynaptic uh, communication. Did you look at myosin motors or the role of, of myosin in that process? From Dutch code lab in Washington. Uh, no, we haven't. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we, we're still in the process of it. And then, then the second question is, uh, again, to the same point is that uh, the, the alpha synuclein, uh, the, the gamma tubulin, sorry, the gamma tubulin staining in the um, presynapses, 
that's a critical factor, right? Yeah. Uh, and and you, because you started off with two models and you didn't actually exclude the second model, that it is partly the rescue. The, yeah. Right. Yeah. We 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 haven't uh, exclude that. We just uh, prove that at least the nucleation is involved. So did you, for example, stain for CAMSEP two, which is a minus end marker, because that would say where it is. Or stain for uh, augmenting complexes. Yeah. So uh, let's say other markers that you give you more confidence that your one of these models is right, or maybe both is right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So so that's what I'm trying to do right now. So to look at the minus ends augmenting and the gamma tubulin staining, and also actually GAMSAP three has also implicated in uh, the minus ends of um, uh, of neuronal microtubules. So those are all both uh, very good candidates. And also, we d because we didn't f like fully exclude the rescue factor, so we're also looking to, uh, to to do experiments in uh, some rescue factor knockdown, for example, CLASP or um, XMAP215 to further confirm that whether it's true that it could be involved or it's not. So, um, but right now we don't know yet, but uh, nucleation we know is most likely to be involved. Yeah. Um, great yes. work. Uh, do you have evidence that the microtubule elongation actually propels the vesicle? or that once propelled, the vesicle uh, can undergo release? Uh, and if it's not propelling, but just allowing uh, a track, laying down subway track, uh, then uh, couldn't the bidirectionality be conferred by motor actions rather than by the track elongation itself? Yeah, those are great questions. So we, when we uh, look at how the uh, synaptic vesicle motility is, uh, is induced after uh, synaptic activation. We look at that also in gamma tubulin knockdown neurons to just to see if we disrupt the tracks, if we can disrupt the movement. And, and we find that it's dependent on the uh, elongation or nucleation of microtubules. But exactly how that's dependent on uh, the motors or whether that's related to uh, the, uh, the release uh, we still uh, don't know yet. 